Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Green Medicine Cabinet and Therapies Breakout. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, both of the presentations for this breakout will be uh, are pre-recorded. Unfortunately, our presenters were unable to join us live, uh, but they were generous enough to pre-record their presentations so that they could still participate in the conference. As such, unfortunately, we won't be able to answer any audience questions live during this session, but we will collect all of the questions from the chat and attempt to answer them uh, after the conference has concluded. Our first uh, pre-recorded presentation is called Play with a Purpose, and it is a collaboration between uh, a physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy for the treatment of neuromotor impairments. I'm Lisa Balderas, pediatric physical therapist with Curly and Pediatric Therapy, and I'm here today with Megan Harrison, a pediatric speech pathologist, and Kate Yates, a pediatric occupational therapist. And we are here today to talk to you about collaboration between PT, OT, and speech um, for patients with neuromuscular disorders. And the goal of our presentation is play with a purpose. So I'm going to start off with physical therapy and um, the considerations for that. So when you think about pediatric physical therapy, you think about um, these things that are listed here. Um, joint range of motion, being able to attain full joint range of motion and then maintain it throughout the lifespan. Also with that comes flexibility. So ideally you want your patient or your child to be actively attaining those jo that joint range of motion, but if they can't, then the caregiver would need to step in and help with that. Um, strength, that's where you can do all kinds of different things with strengthening and not just sets and reps and counting and working specific muscles, but making it part of play, um, throwing a ball back and forth, just being able to come from sit to stand as a strengthening activity, and then using equipment like therapy balls and slides and bolsters. And then you think about the functional mobility, mobility, which is that movement. Are you working on rolling, sitting, crawling? being able to stand, being able to walk, being able to ride a bike, and meeting the patient where they are and helping them achieve that functional mobility. And with that also comes transfers. I think the biggest part of that is what is the patient or your child motivated to do? And you're really only going to get good participation if that motivation is there. And I think you're gonna hear that as a key word throughout this presentation because motivation is really what drives that child to do what they want to do. Um, and then when you think of physical therapy, you think about bracing, meaning ankle foot orthotics or shoe inserts or um, other equipment that a, a patient might need, whether it's wheelchairs or bath chairs or standers or adaptive bikes, any of that equipment that helps a patient meet their potential and meet their goals. So then you want to look at is your child better for traditional physical therapy or some alternatives or maybe a combination of both? So, you know, a lot of these children with neuromuscular disorders are in therapy for years and they can get burnt out. So sometimes it's nice to throw in other activities like doing aquatics therapy or doing some massage therapy or a therapy utilizing equine movement, which is using a horse to achieve some of the, some of the goals. And you may want to look outside of the clinical setting like adaptive swim lessons, adaptive horseback riding, dance classes, gymnastics, martial arts, and yoga. And all of this is going to change throughout the lifespan. So meeting that patient or that your child where they are and making everything fun is the goal. Um, when you think about physical therapy, you also think about daily home exercise programs. And this really should just be play. It should be playing with your child, but playing with your child in a way that gets them motivated and then having their goals in mind. So having the patient be set up for success and how do you do that? You have to look at their mood. Are they in the mood to play that game with you that day or do that stretch with you that day? What environment are they in? Are they in a fun environment where they can participate? Is their sensory system organized, which Kate is gonna to talk to us about later? Did they get enough sleep? Are they hungry? Are they in pain? And I think all of those questions have to be asked before the patient is motivated to participate. Um, are you going to be able to use distractions or rewards? What kind of toys does that, does that child enjoy playing with? 
and using a variety of toys to incorporate into their daily activities and then switching it up because what they like one day might not be th what they like the next. So that's where variety is key comes in. Um, and then how can you add all of those skills together? So Megan's going to talk about speech and Kate's going to talk about occupational therapy, but a lot of times one activity can incorporate all three of those therapies into one. Can you have a child stand up in a stander while they're participating in a fine, fine motor activity and then using a communication device to explain what they want and what they want to play with and why? So incorporating that and, and joining that all together is key. I'm going to hand it over to Megan to talk about speech. Hello. I wanted to share a little bit about what speech therapy is and some of the components that we might address based on the client's needs and abilities. Speech therapy is a therapy discipline that works on promoting the understanding and use of language and its components. We work across the age span, so this is going to start early on in early intervention, birth to three or birth to five, depending on your state or area, and go all the way up into adulthood. Some of the areas we might be addressing would be receptive language, which is your understanding of language, expressive language, which is using both nonverbal and verbal speech to communicate your wants and needs, articulation, which is the pronunciation of sound, voice, which is looking at the pitch, the volume, the quality that supports sound production, fluency, which is your flow and rhythm of speech, swallowing, which is the ability to take in foods, chew, swallow safely to support nutritional demands, Hearing impairment, the ability to have awareness of the acoustic signal and work with amplification systems to address language development. Pragmatics, which is the use of language for social purposes. Cognition, which assists with memory, attention, problem solving, and regulation. And this can be further impacted by genetic disorders, developmental disabilities, or traumatic brain injuries. <clears throat> Some of the considerations we think about in speech therapy or start at the eval and move to through the therapy. The first thing is individualized. We want your evaluation and treatment to all be individualized to the motivators and the needs of what your this individual needs. The second thing we look for in the evaluation and therapy process is dynamic assessment. This means that we are constantly looking at what this individual is doing, what they're enjoying, what they're motivated by, what their needs are based on their caregivers, and how that is looking successful or the areas where we need to look more about how building up that skill so it can be at the highest level possible. Remember, we are trying to address their learning needs, their social emotional goals, their physical goals, and their medical goals. So motivation and the communication of those needs is extremely important across all environments that they're going to be interacting in. A second, a second tenet that we're kind of looking at is the highest level of communication. And this is basically looking at every mode of communication that is accessible to them through a total communication approach and giving them opportunities to do that and do it reliably with a variety of caregivers. Another area is we're looking to embed this, con this communication into all their natural environments and their routines. So we want it into their ADL activities. We want it into doctor's appointments. We want it into play opportunities with peers. We want it in, sc in school. We want it in community outings. And then the big thing is a consideration of the motivators. I think you'll, again, you're going to hear about this through with all of us, but motivation is the key to communication. None of us want to talk about what we don't want to talk about. So if you're not talking about something that interests them or that meets their needs, why put forth the effort? And it does take a lot of effort to access communication sometimes to do that. Another thing I feel is very important and I've learned just in my experience is a caregiver therapist partnership. Parents and caregivers know this individual the best, and it is so key that we consistently listen to them, ask questions, encourage them to share about what's going on at home, what's going on outside of home, and, and navigate that so we can best meet what is motivating and what is necessary to get through the day for the client and the caregiver. 
And the one thing about play is that when we're introducing and using play, because we learn so much through play, is that sometimes play can be very elaborate and complex, and sometimes play can be very simple and extremely social at the basic level. I have found that sometimes the more thought I put into it, it kind of goes off the rails a little bit sometimes. So if I can just make sure that myself, the client and the caregiver are having fun, that our facial expressions are showing enjoyment, that our voices are raised or lowered based on the needs of the client, that sometimes the best communication from, comes from the simplest and most natural interactions. And then the last two things are just be open-minded and flexible. Something in play or in therapy that worked today may not work yesterday, but something you might pull out that did not work two weeks ago may work today. So be flexible, be functional, but have a lot of fun in doing it. If you enjoy it, they will enjoy it. And vice versa, if they're having fun and they're smiling and they're motivated to put forth the effort to communicate, you're gonna be that much more motivated to try for the next piece. And then the last piece that I have found to be very important is what's called return practice. <clears throat> I think in skilled therapy, we tend to go into th the sessions with a plan and we, well, we kind of have what we want to, the goal that we want to work on and we're comfortable with that. But then we sometimes forget that the caregiver has to go home and try to do this on their own. Return practice is when you allow for that caregiver to have a moment in the session to try to do the stretch that you've shown them, to try to do the activity that you've presented, to try to be the leader in the interaction. And I think it sets the tone for one, you to kind of as the, as the clinician to see what do we need to work on, but two, the parent to have some comfort in feeling how that feels, especially when their child resists them and getting feedback of what they can do, but then returning it back into the home setting where they can really practice in a different setting in a dynamic and then see it just kind of have that flows and then have feedback at the next session. And the last thing I wanted to discuss was putting the pieces together of all those components and all those ideas. There are four basic things that I do when I go into every therapy session. And I do this for at the beginning of every session, but I also might do this with every transition to a new activity because this information changes. The first thing I wanna do is an energy check. And this is my read of the room. This is getting information about the emotional climate of what's happening, how the transition to, to therapy was, how the morning has gone, um, just all those different areas that could feed into a successful session or a session kind of falling apart. But I wanna know this from the client, from the individual, but I also wanna check in on the caregiver because I need to know from them where they're at. How animated are they gonna be able to be if they haven't had sleep in, in you know, 20, over 24 hours. These are things that are helpful in navigating our session. The second thing is, as Lisa had discussed a little bit, checking the postural stability and the volitional movement that we have that day. Their bodies are different. Their bodies change. What communication may look like in the morning may not look like that in the afternoon, and we're gonna have to adjust for that. So looking at their seating options, looking at how their body is moving, looking at where their eyes and eyes are going is all dependent upon where their body is supported. And that, again, you're gonna have to make those changes. The third thing is what I think Kate's gonna be speaking more about, and that is the environmental considerations and the sensory needs. So if we bring an individual into a room of bright lights that has light sensitivity, we're setting things off for them right away. So we have to consider what, does, what do we know about this individual, what do they need, and make those changes. I also, in that energy check, I'm gonna get some information from the parent that says, hey, our sensory system is really overstimulated right now, or our sensory system is really low and we can't really get them awake and alert. So when we're thinking about that, we're gonna modify our activities, our interactions to address that. And Kate will speak more about that. 
The last thing, the final fourth thing you think about in a therapy session is we finally get to the communication piece. This is what I have been working on, but communication is dependent on that energy level. It's dependent on that postural stability, and it's a, depending on how they're interpreting their environmental and sensory needs. And are we reading that correctly? So when we get to that communication piece, we want to make sure that they're commuting, communicating something that is intentional, that it's intrinsic to them, that it is motivating, that it is fun, that it is flexible, and that it is functional. And I'll end this with, regardless of what the message somebody gets, respect it. They have worked hard to get this message. They have depended on a lot of things that they need to do to get maybe one message out or multiple messages out. It may not always be the message that you want to hear, but it may be the message that we need to hear. Thank you so much. Here's Kate. All right. So um, the big question always is, what is occupational therapy, especially in pediatrics? So a job of a child is to play, learn, and grow. So let's look at the different occupations of kids. Uh, the first one that we'll look at are activities of daily living skills. So these are skills that are included in bathing and dressing, morning routines, eating, going to the bathroom, uh, and then personal hygiene as well. IADLs include instrumental activities of daily living, which are um, things as far as uh, meal preparation, it could be also medication management or participating in that, uh, as well as learning to clean up after themselves. That's also something that's very important. As Megan has, and Lisa have talked about, rest and sleep is a major component of daily living for our children, and that greatly influences their mood and their ability to participate in functional activities. We also look at education and how to make um, education accessible for them in the least restrictive environment. Play is one of the biggest occupations um, that kids love the most, obviously. Uh, and that's why OT is considered a play-based therapy, because we're using play as a means to achieve our goals. We also look at social skills, so having connections and building those social communication um, skills with others. OT also addresses fine motor skills, so the ability of the fingers and hands to work together. We also look at self-regulation as the ability to stay calm and focused. That is a major component to participation in all therapies. This can also include uh, transitions between preferred and non-preferred activities. A large component of what we do is also we look at sensory environment and what the environment has um, to either offer to support our kids or what we may need to change of the environment to get the maximum uh, benefit for the child. So sensory includes light, sound, taste, touch, smell, movement and balance, the awareness of the body, and uh, body system changes. Occupational therapy so services is kind of the glue that holds us together in that we are very collaborative, um, but also recognizing the sensory needs influence each, each discipline. So one of the things that's important to remember is in order for a child to be able to reach, to activate a switch activated toy, they need to be calm. They need to um, also have skills that they're able to participate in that day. For example, a lighted toy may not be the best fit for a particular day if they did not get enough sleep. Um, things as far as tolerating position changes, like on a ball or a swing, um, in order to gain the maximum stretch that we're looking for. Being able to participate in daily living skills without being overstimulated or having a reaction to movement. 
engaging, I think Lisa talked about this, as far as engaging in a standard um, or a device in order to help uh, participate in hygiene routines as far as brushing teeth um, or standing at the sink to do that. Uh, also using their fingers to initiate communication with AAC devices and even requesting sensory input that they need to prevent a certain behavior. If they need um, a squeeze in order to um, prevent non-destructive behaviors such as biting. I think the take home message from all of this is is the keyword collaboration. I think if you think of two words to take home from today, it's collaboration and motivation. So talking to your therapist, have your therapist talking to each other, because if your PT can't figure out how to get your child to meet a goal, it might be as simple as adding in the speech therapist or the occupational therapist so they can communicate better or so that their sensory needs could be met a little bit better. So really collaborate. Um, with all of your therapists. And two, I think it's okay to take a break sometimes. If something's not working, it's okay to take a break, you know, for a few months or change the frequency of therapy and then revisit it later. Or take a break and do something else and then come back and do it later. So keeping all of that in mind and tailoring it specifically to your individual child. Thank you. All right, and our next presentation is going to be uh, by Dr. Kristen Park, who will be presenting from Children's Hospital of Colorado. Again, that is a video that Dr. Park has pre-recorded for today's conference. All right, thanks so much for uh, allowing me to speak uh, virtually to you at this um, Greekon convention. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Or No, I guess it's all virtual. So, um, I'm sorry I um, had to get this done ahead of time, but um, I've asked, been asked to talk about the um, GREE medicine cabinet and uh, as listed, um, I'm Kristen Park, uh, a pediatric neurology uh, and epilepsy specialist at Children's Hospital Colorado and um, now working um, at the GREE Center. Okay, so here are my disclosures. Um, I am supported by um, grin to b and Cure in the um, Natural History Study, uh, along with Dr. Benke, um, and supported in the GREE Center of Excellence by the grin to b Foundation. And I'm also um, now gonna be on the um, Scientific Advisory Board for the KCNQ2 Foundation uh, and involved in the clinical trial for Redipradil in GREE disorders, GRIN disorders. So the other disclosure I want to make is that even though we'll be talking about a lot of medicines and therapies today, um, you know, this is not necessarily um, medical advice for any particular child. Um, these are, this is general information that's going to be hopefully helpful to some of the medical professionals who may be logging on, uh, as well as uh, families to ask questions to their medical team about these options. Okay, so what are we going to be talking about today? We are going to uh, address uh, seizure management, uh, sleep issues, GI issues, and autonomic storms, all um, frequent symptoms that we hear about in patients with GRE disorders. I did not put a section in for uh, movement disorder issues, um, but that is certainly another common symptom. And then finally, just a couple of slides um, with an update about our clinic. All right, so first general principles that I would like to kind of lay the groundwork for as far as how, how I practice and how I address medical concerns. So first, I think you have to be sure about what you are treating. And I think that involves not just whatever the medical problem is, but also the GRIN diagnosis in specific. So, um, you know, some of these things, some of these variants and genetic test results that we get are not entirely clear, or even if they are clear as pathogenic, they're there is some debate about whether um, the particular variant is a loss of function or gain of function, which is why we're doing this functional evaluation, or we get an indeterminate result that makes it a little bit different and of an issue. And I think that, um, you know, kind of gives us a little bit of caution in thinking about some of these treatments and um, should make us pause a little bit. 
And then the next I would say is, is spell. So not everything that twitches is a seizure, um, as we talked about just a second ago, um, you know, people can have movement disorders, kids can stare off and not be having a seizure. Um, there can be other issues um, that can arouse them from sleep. And so not all of those things are epilepsy and seizures. And that really makes a big difference as far as um, what kind of treatments are chosen. So I'd say the most important thing is to be sure that something is a seizure uh, or something else before trying to embark on a treatment path. And that can be done with lots of testing and we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. I also like to follow the scientific method. So to say, um, if we're going to try something, we only make one change at a time, only one medicine, um, you know, if possible, um, so that we can assess whether that treatment is effective and monitor it in in a in a rational way. So, um, you know, if something is happening five times a day and we make a change, we want to give it, you know, a week to see if it helps. Um, if something is only happening once a month, then we need to give it several months to decide if it's having a benefit. And that also has to take into consideration the pharmacokinetics of the therapy that we're changing um, and, and some other variables. So I think this is a little bit less certain if the um, issue is very severe, if there's frequent bouts of status epilepticus or the patient is in the hospital a lot and you really need to, to make something happen quickly, then I think that's when um, you can make a lot of changes to see if, what helps. Um, I think it's important for the medical person and the family and the patient to have um, a plan ahead of time, maybe even have a time where you say, okay, we're going to monitor exactly how many of these, um, you know, how, how badly this affects things, whether it be constipation or how often somebody weakens overnight. Um, and then we're going to try this intervention. We're going to record for this many weeks afterwards. And then we're going to make a decision about whether or not this has been helpful so that if it hasn't, we can take it away. And if it, you know, if it's somewhat effective, we can talk about dose adjustments, that kind of thing. And I think it helps to outline that ahead of time. Um, I also tend to kind of take a conservative approach and escalate things in a very particular way, starting with kind of um, things that could be done relatively easily. So behavioral modifications, environmental changes, then maybe trying some over-the-counter or naturopathic therapies, um, and then doing prescription medicines. And again, starting with the most benign prescription medicine and escalating to ones that may have more severe side effects to think about. Um, when, again, Again, that that exception can be made if this is really something that is quite disruptive or severe. Um, when I use naturopathic therapies, I typically try to um, use ones that are USP validated, and that means that they've gone through, you know, they're not regulated by the FDA as supplements, but they have gone through an extra step to say this supplement contains what we say it contains. Um, you know, it doesn't contain you know, dirt or twigs or some other, you know, rose hips or whatever, it's, it contains melatonin. That's what we say it contains and it contains this amount of it. Um, and so that is available for many of the, um, of the supplements to, in, in particular brands. All right, so um, if we think first, we, we would talk about epilepsy, and um, certainly uh, it is present in many of the GREE disorders with variable prevalence. So some of them have more common epilepsy, some of them have epilepsy rarely, um, but, um, but it does exist. And, um, you know, I think the first thing to understand is that um, Epilepsy is the occurrence of two or more unprovoked seizures um, more than 24 hours apart. So if someone um, had, if a child especially had a very high fever and had a seizure associated with that, that would be considered a provoked seizure and so wouldn't um, be part of this diagnosis of epilepsy. Or if a child had meningitis and had a seizure during meningitis, that would be a provoked seizure, not, um, not an unprovoked seizure, which would work towards that epilepsy diagnosis. So two or more unprovoked seizures, and often seizures can come together in a little cluster, so they say it needs to be separated by more than 24 hours, um, and that gives someone a diagnosis of epilepsy. And then in epilepsy, there are lots of different types of seizures. And so the type of seizure often in, you know, helps us to determine which type of medication will be best for a particular patient. And so um, 
the seizures are generally um, divided into a couple of categories. One, one category, we, re we really don't know, we didn't have enough information, or it's hard to classify it. But then the typical categories are either focal, meaning starting from one particular spot in the brain and then spreading, uh, or generalized, meaning starting from the whole brain at the same time. And um, each of those has kind of some subcategories based on the symptoms that they um, produce. So for focal seizures, they produce a symptom in the area of onset of the seizure. So if the seizure begins in the area of the brain that responds um, to visual stimulation, you may see sparkling lights or flashing colors or um, some sort of weird um, shadow or something in the vision. Um, on the other hand, if it starts in the area that controls your hand, then that hand may have twitching or posturing or become kind of stiff, um, so, so on and so forth. So as opposed to generalized seizures, which typically kind of involve the whole body, so the whole body can become stiff or all of the limbs can shake, um, sometimes um, absent seizures, so staring and blinking can be a generalized type of seizure. And so how do we figure that out? How do we assess that? Um, one of the most useful tools is the EEG, um, and most EEGs nowadays are done with a video associated with them and you can either do a short EEG which kind of tells you um, some background um, information about how the brain waves look and that can give clues to um, what type of seizures someone may have. Um, they can have abnormalities in between seizures called interictal discharges and those can help us to fit the seizure into one category or the other or you can actually have a prolonged EEG that captures the seizure and then someone can actually see how the seizure starts and say, aha, this is a generalized seizure or no, this is a focal seizure. Um, and then hopefully again, we should use these medicines or these other medicines. Um, and then I think the other thing that people often um, use and what is really important in making the diagnosis is actually describing the seizure. So if your child ever has or your family member ever has a seizure, you know, kind of do your best. I know it's a very scary thing, especially the first time, but do your best to, um, you know, kind of look at what is happening. Is the child's head turning? Is it going to one side or the other? Um, are all the limbs shaking or is it only one half of the body? Um, and that can give a lot of information to the neurologist to help understand what the seizure looks like and what kind of seizure it might be. And then we all have these very powerful devices in our pocket, our cell phones, and a lot of times people will uh, and, and medical providers will request um, videos to help us to understand not only whether something is a seizure, but what type of seizure it might be. And so if you have the ability to film the seizure and bring it in to show uh, your neurologist, that can be very, very helpful. So seizure types are classified into these different modes of onset, right, focal and generalized. But we can also go one step further uh, and classify epilepsy as a syndrome. So a syndrome is um, basically a collection of um, uh, different types of uh, characteristics of the epilepsy that help us to, again, choose the right treatments. So typically it's a seizure type or types, um, what the EEG looks like, and then um, how does that epilepsy usually respond to medicines, what happens over time, um, and and are, is it associated with anything else? And so uh, specifically for GREE, I would say that a, a common one that I've seen is a diagnosis of lennox gastaut syndrome, um, which is um, difficult to treat and has multiple seizure types. And then also ESES or CSWS, and those stand for electrical status epilepticus in sleep or continuous um, spike wave in, in sleep, also previously called Landau-Kleffner syndrome. And we'll talk a little bit about specific treatments for um, at least that second one um, in our, um, in the next couple of slides. So what are our treatments for seizures? Um, the first line of seizure treatment is usually medications. Um, so this is typically recommended after two unprovoked seizures, right? When someone has met that diagnosis of epilepsy. I think I put an asterisk there because the only exception is that sometimes people will have seizures very far spaced apart. So a seizure every two years. And then I think it's a very important discussion to have with your doctor about, is it really appropriate to treat that with a daily medication when it may only happen after another two years. So, um, but barring that, 
that, I think most of the time people would recommend um, treatment after the diagnosis of epilepsy is made. Typically, we try to manage people with seizures on one medicine, um, and if we are not successful, then we try another medicine before we start to combine medicines together in polytherapy, as we call it. Um, most people try to avoid more than two seizure medicines at a time. Um, there's some data that suggests that more seizure medicines often leads to more side effects without much more benefit in seizures, in seizure control. Um, we also try to combine different mechanisms of action. So um, seizure medicines don't all work the same way. They target kind of different things that we know about how seizures spread and how seizures start. And so we try to combine those different mechanisms together. If we combine the same mechanism together, that can be another cause of significant side effects. And that's most notable for sodium channel medications like lamictal and trileptal, um, lacosamide. When we add those medicines together, um, they tend to produce more side effects like dizziness and double vision and um, balance problems. So um, we also know that some medicines work very well together, and the two examples I give here are valproic acid or Depakote and Lamictal. Those medicines have some interactions that make them um, th that make people need to use them carefully together. However, they also seem to kind of boost each other's effectiveness. And the same is true for um, Onfi and Epidiolex. Um, the Epidiolex can raise the level of one of the breakdown products of Onfi and make it more effective. So sometimes those medicines are used in combination. The goal of seizure treatment most of the time is to have seizure freedom without any side effects for the person taking the medication. However, that can become more difficult, especially if um, people have tried two or more medicines, that's when they meet the definition of what we call medically intractable or treatment resistant epilepsy. And in those situations, I think the, the discussions and the decisions become a little bit more difficult about medication management um, and discussions about whether or not seizure freedom is a reasonable expectation and what might we um, want to target instead or how can we balance quality of life with the medications that we're using. Once someone has a diagnosis of treatment-resistant epilepsy, that's when we usually kind of consider some of the therapies that I've listed there on the right. Um, these are called adjunctive therapies. Um, dietary therapy is listed there at the top, so that is um, the ketogenic diet, which is the most restrictive, then the modified Atkins diet, um, which is slightly less restrictive to about 50 to 60 carbohydrates per day, and then the low glycemic index diet, which is also used to treat diabetes. Um, and those diets um, can be very effective, but they can also be very challenging for people to take um, because it involves, you know, restriction of, of everything that goes into someone's body rather than just taking a medication once or twice a day. Um, the next thing that we often consider is whether someone is a candidate for resective epilepsy surgery. So that's when we identify where the seizures are coming from and remove that area of the brain. And I think um, that may be applicable in some grin disorders, especially those associated with focal cortical dysplasia. But I think the, um, there's not necessarily a whole lot of information about um, how kids with grin disorders do, grin disorders do after surgery because they still have a, a genetic variant that affects all the remaining cells in the brain and in the body. And so is this surgery sufficient to allow control of seizures despite that genetic diagnosis? And I think we're not sure about that answer yet. So, um, you know, hopefully we will help get more information as we, as we go forward on research. Um, the next surgical option that I've mentioned there is something called corpus callosotomy. So that is cutting the um, kind of highway or the bundle of fibers that connects the two sides of the brain to each other called the corpus callosum. Um, and that uh, is specifically used for when patients have drop attacks or drop seizures called atonic seizures. Uh, and this helps uh, prevent the seizure from spreading so quickly and causing the person to lose their muscle tone, which is what causes causes them to fall. Um, and so I think that's an option if that particular seizure type is really problematic. That's the seizure type that means people often wear helmets or break their tooth or, you know, uh, whack themselves in the head um, because they fall so quickly. 
And then the last option that I discussed there is, is relatively newer, at least uh, other than the VNS, which is called neuromodulation. So this is using electrical impulses to help um, change brain activity and decrease seizures. And so um, there are several options listed there. The first is the VNS, the vagus nerve stimulator, um, which has a generator in the chest and then wraps around a, um, a nerve in the neck called the vagus nerve. Uh, and it delivers a pulse of stimulation to that nerve as it's programmed to that over time can help decrease seizures. It tends not to make kids seizure free or people seizure free, but it can significantly decrease seizure burden. Um, and sometimes people can decrease their medications as well. The next uh, therapy that I've listed there is RNS or responsive neurostimulation. Um, and so this is a device that is implanted into the brain, either um, on the surface with a strip of EEG electrodes or into the brain um, with what's called a depth probe. Um, again, for focal seizures that we can identify where the onset is and perhaps maybe we can't remove that area or that's not the preference of the person with seizures and their family. Um, and so that device device actually um, is, is responsive because it has the ability to, to kind of listen to brain activity as it's occurring. And when it detects that a seizure is starting, it delivers the pulse of stimulation at that moment um, rather than doing it every you know, five minutes or every three minutes. And that's why it's considered responsive. Um, and then the third uh, type of neuromodulation that is a bit more recent is to simulate a deeper area of the brain called the thalamus, which acts as a relay center to kind of send messages, and we think seizures propagate through the thalamus. So these devices have those depth probes that go into the thalamic nuclei and um, either stimulate them on a regular basis, which is what the DBS does, or again, listen for a seizure to happen and stimulate when a seizure is happening, which is what the RNS does. And the RNS can be therefore implanted on the surface of the brain where the seizure starts or into the thalamus. And so those, I think, are um, options that many families consider after um, they've tried a number of medications. So we'll talk a little bit just about some specific considerations for treatment of epilepsy within GRI disorders. Um, and the first one is a medicine called Parampanel or Ficampa. And so you may recognize in the middle of that name, AMPA. Uh, and so the mechanism of action for this anti-seizure medicine is that it, um, it blocks the AMPA receptor of glutamate, AMPA subtypes receptor of glutamate in the postsynaptic um, region. And so it, it acts to suppress seizures in lots of patients, but it may have some specific um, utility for um, patients with um, glutamate receptor disorders. Um, right now, it's um, indicated for patients who are 12 and older, um, so maybe have some difficulty getting it for younger uh, children with epilepsy, um, but it has been used in both types of seizure disorders, generalized and partial onset. Um, I would say that I think we don't really know how it might um, affect patients who already, especially GRIA patients, who already have decreased AMPA activity, um, and it, it could potentially make things worse there. So I think, again, having a good understanding of what is going on with a particular GRIN diagnosis will make sure that we choose appropriate treatments. The next one is talking about that ESES and CSWS that we mentioned before. Um, and this is something that is often seen in GRIN 2A. Um, unfortunately, I think we don't really understand kind of what the overall history of this EEG pattern is in GRIN 2A. And most people who treat epilepsy only treat that EEG background pattern if it is associated with clear developmental regression, meaning that you know someone had certain skills in language and then they began to lose them or they they lost um, changes or they lost these other areas of function, sometimes behavior or, or motor movements um, based on where the discharges are. And so it's unclear whether these treatments will have the same effect in someone who has a neurodevelopmental issue already and then manifests this abnormal EEG. Is that the same situation? Should we use the same treatments? How long should we treat people? I think those are all questions that are unfortunately not very clear at the moment. 
So this particular diagnosis has very specific treatments because its goal is to affect the EEG and to see if that developmental regression can be reversed um, or improved. Um, the most common treatment that's used is high-dose Valium, administered initially often in the hospital and then continued for a period of time afterwards. Um, although sometimes people use other types of benzodiazepines, including clobazam or Onfi. Some of our standard anticonvulsants have also been used to treat this condition. Um, most commonly, valproic acid or Depakote and levetiracetam or Keppra. Ethosuximide is listed in some of the literature, but that's not necessarily something that I've ever used for this particular condition. There are a few um, uh, small case series of ceozolamide being used. That's actually a diuretic medication, but it can be used for some other medical conditions. Uh, sometimes it's used in breath holding spells or altitude sickness. Sometimes it's used in seizures around menstrual cycles, um, but also has been used in ESES and CSWS. Patients are often also treated with the ketogenic diet, again, especially if some of those earlier treatments aren't effective. Um, and then I put steroids at the bottom in, in kind of gray because that is a commonly used uh, treatment. However, I think it has a lot of potential long-term consequences um, for the body, for the endocrine system, for blood pressure, weight, urinary health. Um, and so I'm, I'm a little bit reluctant to use that sometimes, but it is a documented treatment for, um, for this particular EEG pattern. Okay, so that was epilepsy. Let's move on to sleep. Um, and I think, again, first the important question is, what is the issue and what is being treated? And so most sleep treatments kind of um, are divided into at least, or they, they talk about how effective they are for initiation of sleep, so falling asleep. And then second, for maintenance of sleep, staying asleep, preventing waking up at multiple times during the night. And sometimes both of those things are needed, but medicines can be differentially effective for one or the other of those symptoms. So I think the first thing to think about if uh, a person is having a lot of sleep troubles is could there be something medical going on? Is that important to evaluate? Um, so um, sometimes, especially children who are more severely affected can have um, obstructive or central sleep apnea, which needs to be evaluated with um, a polysomnogram or a sleep study. Um, most of the time, if kids are snoring, that's really not um, something that's gonna lead to that need for evaluation or that diagnosis. But most often what we ask people to listen and look for is pause in breathing, um, headaches that occur right upon awakening in the morning, um, frequent sl slight awakenings overnight, and then sleepiness during the daytime. Those are kind of the cardinal features of someone with um, sleep apnea. And then the sleep study helps to determine whether that sleep apnea is because of obstruction, like from collapsed um, floppy tissue, or whether it comes from the brain's signal uh, about how and when to breathe, which is what central sleep apnea is. Sometimes kids can have restless legs or an urge to move their legs and be very antsy in sleep. And sometimes that can be related to low iron. Um, and so if you that um, take a baseline measurement, um, the normal is actually above 20, but many sleep doctors will say that they can they think symptoms can occur if the level is, is even above that and, and around 50. Um, I, I would say that when this is treated, um, iron supplementation can be pretty constipating, so um, it's best to have someone help you pick a good supplement and, and monitor that to see if it helps versus causes more problems of its own. Um, could someone be having trouble falling asleep because they have reflux? And that can certainly be treated with medications, although a very simple task is um, to sometimes just elevate the head of the bed to prevent that um, acid from coming up as far into the esophagus. Um, so again, kind of in this map, pattern of escalating therapies. We talked about evaluating for other things. I think the next thing is behavioral and environmental changes. Um, so the sleep environment should be pretty quiet, um, dark, and cool. Um, 
you know, I sometimes advise um, white noise machines. Um, our body's signal to go to sleep is a drop in our core body temperature. So kind of avoiding things that raise the core body temperature prior to going to bed can sometimes be um, important. So, you know, exercise or a hot shower, or hot bath, hot tea, all of those things can kind of confuse the, those signals. Um, it's important to have consistent routines and a bedtime that stays consistent throughout the week and the year. Um, electronic use, so that blue light that comes from our devices can, again, disrupt the signals that our body sends to get us to go to sleep. Um, and then to make sure that the area that people are sleeping is safe um, and that it's not used for other things. So it should only be used for sleep. It shouldn't be used for play during the day or someplace that you read and, and do other relaxing activities. I put some resources down there um, for um, learning about sleep and sleep in children um, and families with special needs. So if we go past behavioral therapy and talk about um, over-the-counter and naturopathic treatments, um, this is a good reference that talked all about all of these. Um, so I sometimes will prescribe Benadryl, um, although I will say that I have had some kids become hyperactive with it, so I think it may be wise to test it first. Um, then uh, the next one is 5-HTP or hydroxytryptophan, and this is a precursor in the body used to produce melatonin, which is one of our um, sleep signaling hormones, and then also serotonin, which is, um, again, one of our neurotransmitters. Um, and uh, some, of these, some of these supplements can cause a few side effects, although often they will go away after a little bit of time. Um, so I advise starting with a low dose and, and going slowly. Um, melatonin is frequently prescribed and probably has the most data behind it, especially in kids with neurodevelopmental disorders, um, and it's been used down to kids of uh, six months of age. Um, it can typically be taken 30 to 45 minutes before bedtime, but in adolescents who kind of want to go to bed at 2 a.m. and wake up at 11, even though we ask them to go to bed at 9 and wake up at 6 a.m., um, that's called delayed sleep phase. Sometimes they need to actually start it earlier in the evening to help with that process. Um, melatonin is most, most helpful for sleep initiation, but can also decrease the number of uh, nighttime awakenings in people who take it. Um, and then often if it's used on a regular basis, um, it can um, sometimes I, I, it can lose its effectiveness. And so I have families take holidays, whether that be a weekend or the summer or a week on and a week off, something of that sort. Um, the next one is GABA, which is, as opposed to glutamate, which is excitatory, um, GABA is our major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, so we think about it as the brakes instead of glutamate, which is the gas. Uh, and it's not clear if this actually crosses the blood-brain barrier and makes it into the brain, but some people do feel like it is helpful for sleep um, and can be, again, purchased as a supplement. Um, it's most um, common side effect is typically a bit of drowsiness in the morning. Um, then uh, it can also have some other rarer ones. Next, I'll, um, I'll say magnesium is, is also used, um, not just for GRI um, in general, but for this particular indication, and one of my colleagues kind of swears by it. Um, it does play a role in regulating that GABA, but may also um, inhibit NMDA um, and promote muscle relaxation. So I think in GRIN disorders, perhaps used um, with a bit of caution or understanding of what the mechanism of the, the variant is, um, but it's main side effect is that at high doses, it can cause some loose stools. Um, now we move on to prescription medications. Um, so Benadryl is certainly available over the counter, but there are actually prescription antihistamines that are a bit more uh, strong in their um, in their uh, level, um, and those can be prescribed for sleep. Um, the next one that I usually go to is clonidine, which is actually a blood pressure medication, but it has a lot of use in children, not just for sleep, but also for some ADHD symptoms, so it's very safe. Um, the thing I would say about it is that because it's a blood pressure medication, it shouldn't be started or stopped abruptly, so you can't like take holidays with it the same as you can with melatonin, because it can cause blood pressure to rebound and become high after stopping it. 
Some of the anti-seizure medicines um, can also be used to promote sleep, so gabapentin or neurontin, phenobarbital has sometimes been used. Um, most of the time we don't use benzodiazepines chronically except for onfi because they can develop tolerance over time and you may need higher and higher doses, so I, most people tend to avoid those. Um, there are also some antidepressant medications that can be used for sleep, um, and the basic premise is that these are an SSRI or a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor and work against depression and other mood disorders, but sleepiness is one of their side effects, and so they're often used um, in people who have trouble sleeping, and the two most common are Seroquel and Trazodone. And I think if we, if you and your medical team make it to this particular level, it might be, um, you know, reasonable to consider seeing a sleep specialist. Often that is um, a medical provider in the pulmonology or neurology department. Um, they often also have psychologists who can help with some of the behavioral challenges of sleep. Um, and I think that would be reasonable at, at, you know, if you kind of made it through some of these treatments and they're not working. So next we'll turn to um, GI issues, which again are pretty common. I'm mostly going to talk about constipation. Um, and there is now this growing body of literature saying that um, our, you know, our brain is connected to our gut um, and is also connected to the microorganisms that live in our gut um, and help us to digest food and, and you know, protect against infection and have a whole bunch of other jobs. And so glutamate is needed there too. And so receptor dysfunction can cause GI symptoms most definitely definitely in, in, in patients, as can hypotonia and other associated signs and symptoms. Um, I would also say that urinary health and GI health are, are closely intertwined, um, and so um, it often happens that those two professions work together to manage constipation. So the first kind of environmental or behavioral intervention is um, positioning. So I put this um, picture up there and basically our toilets are designed to put us at 90 degrees, at which point there is a muscle that kind of chokes off the um, interrectal angle and makes it more difficult to go to the bathroom. Um, but if we kind of go towards this squatting position, which is probably how we went to the bathroom for most of history, um, you know, we can uh, improve that angle and allow um, the stool to come out and relax that muscle to make things easier. And that can be certainly helpful um, for kids who have trouble going to the bathroom. So um, I put the advertisement there or the um, information there for Squatty Potty, which is one of the um, uh, tools that one of my developmental pediatric colleagues recommends most frequently. And then that second video is one for kids about unicorns and pooping and maybe makes it a little bit more, um, more fun. I've also put some other resources for um, constipation, for toilet training, and um, uh, other associated uh, stooling issues um, in children with special needs there, um, and, and hopefully these slides will be available to you on the website afterwards if you want to use them for reference. So again, from behavioral to naturopathic treatments, I think um, pro and prebiotics can be very helpful in maintaining a normal gut flora and helping our body to do its job digesting our food. Um, dietary changes can, uh, can have a lot of impact, so increasing our roughage and our fiber, um, making sure that we get adequate hydration. Some families also have a fair amount of success just adding some prunes in. Um, but if those things are not successful, then it, you know, it may be time to think about um, various medication treatments. And they kind of come in several different categories. So the first is um, osmotic laxatives, which de are designed to not be absorbed and taken as a medication, but they act to draw water into the colon um, to help make the stool softer. And that comes in a couple of different types. Um, and I would say that the ones that I've listed first there um, should be used in caution. Uh, with caution, they're saline-based, and sometimes, especially if, if people have comorbid renal issues, um, they can throw off electrolytes, um, and so they may also not be recommended for a chronic basis. Um, the next is Miralax, which is polyethylene glycol, and again, some concern has been raised recently for this um, in chronic long-term use in children, so I think it's important to, to speak with your medical team about that. The next is bulk forming laxatives. So that again acts to kind of um, form the stool and make it easier to pass. It may also stimulate the intestines to contract and push the stool um, 
stool along. Um, and that comes in, again, a number of different um, varieties. And there's brand names for those that I did put in there. But the most common, I think, is psyllium husk that um, is, is sold in a variety of different formulations and um, is a fiber um, that, that acts to kind of help in this. It's also used in irritable bowel syndrome and a number of other GI conditions. Finally, there's stool softeners to help, um, again, if, they, if stools are dry and hard and bulky. Um, and then lubricants to actually just help the stool at the end, getting out of the rectum. Uh, and then finally, um, stimulant laxatives, which again, cause the colon to push the stool along. Um, and those are the different types of that. Uh, I think those there is some, again, concern that that can produce dependency if it's used chronically. Um, other GI issues are certainly um, common. So some kids can, can have, have significant reflux or air swallowing, um, food refusal. Um, I, I think um, reflux medicines are another very common treatment um, for um, patients with neurodevelopmental issues and hypotonia um, and, and often end up needing to be daily. There are um, over-the-counter and prescription varieties that are used for reflux. Um, feeding can be a, an issue as well, um, having trouble swallowing, um, taking a long time to eat, um, and, and not growing. And I think um, that can be a safety concern um, for aspiration, which can cause pneumonia and chronic lung issues. Um, and so swallowing testing is sometimes um, important, as well as um, uh, considering a gastrostomy tube when that's necessary. Um, at our hospital, we have um, something called an aerodigestive clinic that is a collaboration between the pulmonologists um, and the GI department, and I think that's often common in pediatric hospitals, and that may be a useful resource um, if there are issues with both the lungs and feeding. Um, and then finally, um, nutrition. I think it can be really important to work with a dietitian, especially if kids have lower uh, caloric expenditures because they're not as active. Um, that can change the balance of how much food is needed. And um, if they have food preferences or um, restrictions, then you, know, you may need to consider dietary supplements. And so I think a nutritionist can be very helpful in that regard. Um, so the last kind of set of symptoms that we'll talk about are um, autonomic storms, um, and the technical medical term for this is PSH, or paroxysmal sympathetic hyperactivity. Um, and these are not seizures, um, but they can have some signs and symptoms that uh, resemble seizures or make families concerned of, about that. Um, often um, people having this can be um, inconsolable, they can be crying, they can appear uncomfortable with arching or um, posturing, and their heart rate can go up, um, they can sweat and become flushed, their blood pressure can go up, their temperature can go up, and these are all signs of of sympathetic overactivity. So our nervous system, our peripheral nervous system is divided into kind of two categories, um, our fight and our flight, uh, and then our, um, you know, kind of a adjust and reproduce and, and relax kind of nervous system. So our fight and flight nervous system is called our sympathetic nervous system that allows us to kind of get ready. Um, and so it, it, it helps our muscles get ready. It helps our pupils focus in. It helps our, our energy, you know, kind of mobilize. And then our relax and digest nervous system, our parasympathetic nervous system. So all these are signs of overactivity of the sympathetic nervous system. And these types of storms are actually not unique to grief disorders. Um, they are present in a number of other um, developmental and epileptic encephalopathies associated with other genetic conditions um, and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, as we've talked about. And so I think this is an area that is hopefully going to get some more research because there are um, kind of limited options and data, especially for kids at, at this point in time. Um, these episodes, I think one of the distinguishing features about them that makes them um, different from seizures is their duration. They can often ask, last for quite some time, you know, 20 minutes to hours, um, and then um, people often fall asleep after them because they're kind of exhausted, and that's another similarity to seizures. They also often cause people to fall asleep as well afterwards, so I, I think the duration is really one of the key distinguishing features. Most of the time people feel like abortive therapy is not like so therapy given when an episode is is happening is not necessarily um 
typically effective. And so the treatments largely focus on preventing episodes from happening and then, um, you know, by, by modulating triggers and then also trying to, um, uh, you know, give a, a baseline treatment to prevent these episodes if triggers can't be identified or, or modified. So some of the most common triggers are um, our heat, um, our overstimulation, um, sleep issues, bowel and bladder issues, um, pain, um, often a positional um, kind of aspect to things. And so I think the first recommendation is often for families to kind of take a step and um, and write down when these things happen, what was happening in the environment when they occurred, um, what changes did you try to see if they would go away, um, to kind of help be detectives and figure out if there are modifiable things in the environment that can help stop these from happening. And then as far as treatment, as I said, most of the medical literature is surrounding um, patients who have had a, um, acute traumatic brain injury, um, most often adults and while they are still in the hospital. So very little data about um, people with other neurodevelopmental issues, about kids, about chronic therapy, all, all things that we, we need to work on. So the most common treatment, I think, are, again, blood pressure medicines. And so here you see clonidine again. We saw it for sleep. Um, in this situation, it acts to decrease norepinephrine, one of those fight or flight um, neurotransmitters. And so it acts to increase it in the brain. Um, it is available um, in a solution, a compounded solution, so specialized pharmacy, but also a pill and a patch for uh, long-acting uh, relief during the course of the day. Um, propranolol uh, is also a blood pressure medication and blocks the effects of those neurotransmitters. Um, and I think the um, reason it gets some attention is because it's also been used for performance anxiety and some of those symptoms maybe overlap, right, when you think about what that entails. Um, and it's also used um, in pediatrics for a lot of cardiac things and so, so pretty safe and, and reasonable to try. Um, sometimes, again, if it's thought that pain is the trigger, um, you know, you can treat with Tylenol or even more significant um, non-opioid pain medications. Many people also feel like dystonia um, can frequently precede these episodes, and so there's kind of a list of escalating therapies um, as management of dystonia. I'm not going to go through all of those. And then when I listened to the last um, Greekon, I was listening to this lecture about, um, about autonomic storms, and they had mentioned bromocryptine, um, which is a dopamine agonist, and I, I, I was only able to find one case report, um, again, in use in a child um, after a significant brain injury um, and ha kept having these episodes in the hospital. I think this agent has a bit of a higher side effect profile and so may not be the first choice. So that was it for all of the medicine cabinet. And so finally, I would just um, draw your attention to um, our emails for um, reg um, registration into our natural history study, um, which is a questionnaire-based family report of symptoms and diagnoses um, for patients in Europe, Asia, or Africa. Um, Dr. Lemke is in charge of that, and that's his email address. And then for patients in North or South America or Australia, that's myself um, and Dr. Benke and uh, then uh, Jennifer Bain at New York is also uh, working through the Simons Foundation to gather data. And then finally, um, just a little bit of information about the Center of Excellence. So um, this is here at Colorado um, for people with all types of um, ionotropic glutamate receptor disorders. Um, we're seeing into adults, even though we are a pediatric hospital, because we think that's important to understand um, what these diagnoses look like when patients are older and um, what areas do we need to focus on uh, across the lifespan. The um, team uh, has neuropsychologists um, along with a number of other specialists, including um, physicians and therapists, um, our coordinator, and then hopefully uh, family liaison at, at all of the visits. Um, we are working to align ourselves with um, Dr. Vinma's program in the Netherlands and also Dr. Lemke in Germany. Um, and trying to do that with standardized assessments, which will hopefully supplement, um, you know, be, be validated measurements that will supplement the information that patients and families are providing. 
Um, certainly our goal is to facilitate research um, and to teach families and help educate them, but also to learn from them as they are the experts in their kids. Um, and then um, just an update that we've had four clinics so far and seen just under 20 patients. Um, we will be seeing patients in collaboration with the upcoming Grin2B conference in July. Um, and this is our email and um, phone number. Our nurse coordinator is Riley Vandenbrook, who uh, some of you may met as she came to the last um, Grin meeting. And so with that, I will thank you for letting me uh, talk at you for a while about these um, symptoms and treatments, and I hope that everyone has uh, a good conference.